welcome back to channel. It's so great to see you all. And we have a great, uh, this is the start. And lots, uh, lots more to come in, which you do know about. And we especially hope to see you at University for a Day, which is next week. The, uh, the, the uh, George Mitchell, who is coming on October 6th. Very kind to give us a date quickly, and uh, so here we go. But today, it's my pleasure to welcome back to the Shemel Forum a woman who brings the world to us from the perspective of the arts with a mindset of a cultural historian. Annie views events and people, mostly but not exclusively in the arts, from her own unique point of view. One could say that much like the subject of her most recent book, she is an immigrant and a pioneer, and if not an artist, a scholar with formidable aesthetic sensibilities. I don't think I've mentioned before, but maybe I have, how and why and when and where we met. It was in 1988 at the Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia. Hmm? Well, Eighty-nine. Okay. Okay. Good, <laughs> good thing she's here. <laughs> anyway, it's the opening of an exhibition that featured American artists who were included in the famous Paris Exposition of 1880. 1889. 1889. Okay, just checking. Annie was the at the time cultural council counselor for the French Embassy here in New York, and I was cultural advisor to Governor Bob Casey. We bonded instantly, immediately organized a conference at the University of Pennsylvania on artists and intellectuals who are from the US who were expatriates in France. And from there continued in collaboration and most important in friendship until this day. Annie was born in Algeria and immigrated to France with her family at the age of 14. She is in, the, in, in essence a citizen of the world at once never at home and always at home. A cosmopolitan and an outsider who understands that aspect of the subject of her new book. The compelling and in some ways inscrutable artist, one of the most important painters of the 20th century, Mark Rothko. As Rothko revealed to his good friend Jack Kufeld, he was looking for the essence of the essential. That was his whole aim. Serious business. I will not say more. Please welcome Annie Consol. Thank you, Sandra, for this perfect introduction. Perfect. Not too long, up to the point. And listen to me, Sam, because I decided to dedicate this lecture to you. OK? So it's dedicated to Sam here, who came specially from New York to listen to me. And I am very moved. So Sam, put up your cell phone and listen to me now. <laughs> and then you're going to have to challenge me on that. So I'm delighted to be there, as usual. And if you don't invite me next year, I'll understand that I'm gone, OK? <laughs> that I'm bad, that I am uh, has been, OK? So if I don't come to the Schimmel Forum in the next two years, please, uh, I mean, I'll go to my shrink. <laughs> I, uh, there's going to be a problem. Okay. I promise. <laughs> uh, the, for a few years, when I came to the U.S., actually, in 1980, Eight or nine. 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 <laughs> thank you, Sandra. In 1989, I was a scholar who had been spending a few years on a French writer called Jean-Paul Sartre. So my specialty and my PhD was French intellectuals dealing with the Communist Party. Now. My book had been a bestseller in many countries. It was commissioned by an American publisher, Andre Schifrin, a wonderful man. But when I arrived in the US, I immediately met an American dealer called Leo Castelli, who decided to teach me American art. Since that day, I kept my tools of a sociologist and a historian and applied them to the art world. And thank God I did so, because it's much more fun to deal with the art world than to deal with communist intellectual. <laughs> so since I, for, for now 25 years, I have been trying to understand from the point of view of social history, 
what the art world is about. This is my third book about American art. This one is devoted to an artist and one of the main artists, Mark Rothko. The previous one I came to speak about it here was devoted to the gallerist Leo Castelli. And my first one called Painting American was devoted to the collectors. Now, I am not a traditional art historian. Traditional art historians would describe to you this painting telling you it's green and gray and so on. My, my, and this is what I call text versus context. And I tend to be interested in the art, but also in the context, in the situation in which the, 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 the artist is put all his life long and how he reacts to it. For me, the art is a production which tells us about the situation of the artist in the world. So, uh, when I first uh, was, invite was invited to lecture on this book, which appeared last March, I, uh, I, ha I, uh, I, had, I was presenting it um, and telling people that my, my focus on this book, which appears on page nine at the beginning. And because I decided to approach Mark Roscoe through the migrant issue, the issue of the fact that he was a refugee from Russia. I'm going to read to you what it means here. In navigating through diverse sources, my personal perspective on Rothko evolved as I investigated how, how young Markus Rodkovich, as a cultural agent crossing geographic boundaries, managed to shape the intellectual and cultural landscape in the United States. All the documents have been gathered and presented with this migratory force and transposition of thought in mind. Now, when I explain my topic to the different people who listened to me in March and April in the United States, they were not quite there. Now, six months later, Every day you see the issue which um, is destroying us in Europe and which will, is making Europe explode. It's the migratory issue. Well, those people coming from Syria, from Eritrea, five, I mean, half a million having reached the shores of Europe since the beginning of 2015. And, uh, you know, people saying horrible things like migrants are a burden, when I think that migrants are a resource. So today, I am going to approach Mark Roscoe as a social historian, uh, describing him as a migrant and his productions are the consequence of the wounds that he felt as a refugee in the United States. Uh, okay? And if you don't agree with me, I'll try to convince you more <laughs> how important it is. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I will argue that it is because he was a migrant that he became an artist, and because he was a migrant that from an artist he became a pioneer. And that <clears throat> looking at Marcos was much more than a question of colors. You know, yesterday, I don't know if some of you are on Twitter, I'm on Twitter because my son is on Twitter. So to communicate with my son, I go tweet. I tweet. Yesterday was a day where people in museums, they said there was a day of ask a curator. So people would ask anything they wanted from curators in museums. Uh, on, um, on Sunday, I'm going to speak at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, which is opening a Rothko show. And there was somebody who wrote to the Houston curator, which color did Rothko like the most? And she said, red. So I felt big deal, you know? <laughs> but I'm going to try and show you that Roscoe is much more than a darkening of the palette, that the question of red or blue, that he is an artist, an intellectual, an activist, an educator, and a pioneer. So <clears throat> um, first of all, he had many names. Where is the clicker here? I don't know, I have a clicker somewhere? Clicker. The clicker too, it's okay, I can point for him. Uh, first of all, he, was, he, he had many names. 
um, Mark Rosko, Marcus Rotkovich in, in Russian, in, in Latvian, in English. And uh, he was born in Dvinsk, Russian Empire, 1903, and uh, died in New York City, where he committed suicide the 25th of February, 1970. Okay, so first let's go, let's look at his aesthetic trajectories that, uh, you know, all of us know, but we should remind that in fact, maybe there's an art historian in the room who wants to kill me. So before being killed by art historians, we're going to go through the aesthetic trajectories. That's what Roscoe's art is like when he's doing figurative art at the very beginning of his, at the beginning of his life. It's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful scene called, uh, actually the colors are not exactly right, but it's the Schemmel Forums problem, I think. <laughs> Last year it was the same way, but don't worry. I mean, the, the, what you see, Green should be brown, you know, here. So just imagine it's brown, and then you're back into Roscoe's colors. So it's called a, a scene in the subway. And in 1940, he's shifting his aesthetic to a period that people call symbolic, uh, mythological, 1940. Then he's going into symbolic, a symbolic period, a surrealist period, then multiform period. Then he's slowly going into what will become, and what you see brown should be orange, okay? So then he's going into slowly into a multiform period, and this is a, another element of his multiform period, and in 1950, he is reaching his signature style around 1950, and you know, that you know, that everybody knows about Rothko, which is basically abstract colors and f rectangles of colors floating on top of the other one. This is basically Roscoe's signature style. So he has 10 years of shifting between 1940 and 1950 until he reaches that. And with that, he's extremely famous. He's going to produce this gorgeous uh, yellow, these gorgeous you know, blues and red, this gorgeous, you know, orange and, oh, the colors are not exactly, the blues, the blue is par perfect, you know, these extraordinary blues. This one, which is wonderful. This one, which he did for the Seagram building, and I think it looks like a gimel, like, a, like an uh, Hebrew alphabet, you know. Uh, gimel sofit, more, right? It's a gimel sofit. This is a gimel sofit, okay. And this is, uh, you know, 1963, uh, and then at the end of his life, he does this gray, bra uh, gray on, on black. And you know, some art historians argue that everything you need to understand about Rothko is a darkening of the palette at the end of his life. And that's why he will commit suicide. That's what they say. And I think that's very stupid and very simplistic. So I will try to show you that my version is more complex and therefore that's why I'm taking the social historical. And I, I uh, you know, there was somebody who interviewed me yesterday at the, in Martha's Vineyard and said, do you mean that social history is more important than art? I said, no, art is more important. She said, do you think that we should read the book rather than see the paintings? I said, no, you should see the paintings. But if you read the book, you'll get to the paintings with some other level of understanding. Okay, so don't get me wrong. So we're going to look at his trajectory. First of all, he's an immigrant. He arrives in New York City at the age of 10 in 1913. And uh, after being sent by his father to a Talmud Torah school, which is a religious school for Jews, although the father was a secular Jew, the father was a pharmacist, a very well-read man who was the public writer for the city and who was a Marxist, and whose older children went to public schools. But why did he put the younger one, the small one, Marcus, to a Talmud Torah school? It was to prevent him from going into the draft of the Russian army, because the Russian army was taking Jewish boys into the army for 25 years at the time in Russia. But they were not taking to the army those religious boys. So only to protect his son, the father put him in a religious school, 
And when he arrives, Mark, the little boy, Marcus Rodkovich, is all immediately becomes a polemical student. So in Portland, they go to Portland. Why do they go to Portland? Because the father had a brother in Portland, Maine. So the, you know, the immigrants join the family. You know, they go to the place where they know they have families. So they go to Portland, and here it is. And, but as an immigrant, young, the little boy is excluded from the newspapers. So he goes to the community, um, the, uh, the, the Jewish community. There's a neighborhood in Portland called Little Odessa. Little Odessa. So in Little Odessa, they have a community uh, called the Neighborhood House. And in this magazine, the Neighborhood, little Marcus Rodkovich is writing the editorial. You know, Marcus Rodkovich. So he becomes right away an editorialist for the newspaper of the community because he's not allowed in the newspaper of the larger audience at school. Then very quickly, he gets it to Yale because he's a brilliant scholar together with his friends, Mac, Max Neimark and Harry Director. Uh, so much so that the newspaper, local newspaper, is writing that three Russian boys, none of whom has been in this country longer than seven years, are already admitted into Yale. And Yale is basically the best of the best in the academia, elite school. He arrives there, but he is not happy in the way he looks on this picture. I don't look like that. <laughs> he thinks it's a little stiff. So he's very happy, very proud. He's going to the best possible place. But uh, he's totally disappointed because when he arrives at Yale in 1925, there's been a huge immigration of Jews from Russia. In four decades, 2.5 million of people arrived to the United States, 2.5 million. And the Jewish boys were very bright. So he faces a great, uh, and there are very drastic anti-immigration laws at the time in the United States. And he finds anti-Semitism at Yale, uh, which is absolutely horrible. Because everything around the campus is made for athletes and for fraternities. So if you're not a WASP in a fraternity, or if you're not a good sports guy, I mean, you know, you're out. And this is what the dean of Yale College is writing to the president, 1925. Listen, I think we shall have to change our view in regard to the Jewish element. We should do something to improve them. They are getting there rapidly. If we don't educate them, they will overrun us. A few years ago, every single scholarship of any value was won by a Jew. We must put a ban on the Jews. Okay, it's official. I mean, you can read this book. It's a very interesting book on, on Yale at those, in, during those years. So this is what this brilliant little boy from Russia is fighting, fighting. What does he do? As I told you, he was an activist. He does not become a victim of the situation. He becomes an activist and expresses his opinion. And that he's creating a new, new newspaper called the Yale Saturday Evening Pest. <laughs> The, he creates a newspaper and he will destroy the newspaper. But in this newspaper, he expresses his opinions and this is what he says. False gods, meaning sports and fraternities. False gods, idols of clay. There is only one way to smash them. And that is a revolution in mind and spirit in the student body at Yale University. Let us doubt, let us think, that is enough. So he is very clear minded about where he is, what he wants to do, and what he refuses. So after a year and a half of this treatment, where he feels like an outcast, he leaves Yale University. And he goes to his family, the Weinsteins, and works for a few months in the Schmattes business. I don't know if you know what that is. It's fabric. It's uh, the word in Yiddish who says, working in the clothing business. So he works. But one day he goes to see a friend who's an artist at the um, educational center, and he thinks that this is where he can insert his identity as an American in the art world. You know, he cannot become a lawyer, 
He cannot become a medical doctor, but he will become an artist. That's how he can express himself. So he becomes an artist where he can find mentors, such as Milton Avery and Max Weber. He works with them for 10 years. And especially, he's bonding with a group of other artists, the group of the 10, who says about themselves that they're experimenters by the very nature of the approach and consequently strongly individualistic. The point is that this group of the 10, there were only nine, but you know, nobody cares. <laughs> and here they are. Here they are. They are Ilya Bolotovsky, Adolf Gottlieb, Louis Harris, Jankel Kufeld, Markus Rotkovich, Louis Schenker, Nahum Chabakchov, Joseph Solman, and Benzion Weinman. What is the common point among them, you think? They were all my immigrants, refugees. If not first generation, second generation. All Jewish. Uh, and do usually, you know, usually artists bond when they paint the same way. You know, they, the same aesthetics. No, those ones were painting completely different ways. Some were figurative, some were having Jewish themes, some were abstract, some were <laughs> surrealist. So just to show you that the it's so important in the art world to talk about the social element. You know, they were bonding because they were feeling this, this feeling of the outcast. Um, another aspect of Roscoe's intellectual life is that in 1940, he decides to put his brushes aside and to write a book. 1940, it's not any year. It's a year, the year where Hitler is coming, invading Europe. It's a dramatic year. So he stops painting and rereads all, uh, all the books he has next to him, like Freud, like Jung, like Nietzsche. And he is uh, revisiting art history, like what were the greatest moments in art history, the golden moments, what, who were the great masters of the past. This is the manuscript. The, and the book he writes is called The Artist's Reality. What is art? What is the function of art in society? What is the function of an artist? And he, the, the, per, the, 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 the painter he's the most fascinated by will be Rembrandt, this extraordinary Dutch master from the 17th century who, in the end of his life, reinvented himself. He didn't want to paint what his, pat his patrons were expecting him to paint, but he was searching for something new, which was how to represent light on a canvas. And you know, so Rembrandt was bankrupt, but he preferred hunger to compliance. And this is the model that Rothko will be taking. So these are a few sentences from his manuscript. Um, Art is not only a form of action, it is a form of social action. The history of art is the history of men who, for the most part, have preferred hunger to compliance. Then he became a professor, an educator, at the Brooklyn Jewish Center's School Academy, following John Dewey's <coughs> theories, very progressive, saying, you know, art is an experience. You are, you are your own master. Do not follow me, but challenge me. The professors needed to be challenged by the artist, by the student. And I actually, when I lectured in Boston, had in my audience one of Rothko's students from this academy. And I said, come here to the podium and tell us. And he said it was extraordinary. He said, Rothko, Rothko tell, uh, told us, be yourself. Paint differently from me. Challenge me. You know? So that was this kind of attitude of progressive education, where the teacher shouldn't be followed, but challenged, you see? And uh, so he, he, he loved teaching. And then he loved looking, searching, shuttling between the West Coast and the East Coast, between US models and European models, between Clifford Steele, that should be yellow and not green, OK? Mm -hmm. You correct that. Between Clifford Steele in San Francisco and Paul and, and Henri Matisse in New York. So this is red. The canvas is called the Red Studio. It was painted by Matisse in 1913, 
and was bought by Alfred Barr from MoMA in 1950. Roscoe saw this painting exhibited in the hall, which had been j just joining the permanent collection, and he was mesmerized by this piece. He sat in front of this piece for three weeks, and after that he switched to his signature style. And why is this painting so important? First of all, because the red is completely covering everything. And if there's a color which counts in Roscoe's life, it's red, right? That's what the, the curators answered this guy yesterday. But <laughs> what I like about this painting is that it's a studio mm. with works of art, be paintings or sculptures, which are not finished. They are in progress. And in the center, in the bottom, you see this void, which is a place where the artist should stand, right? So he's coming, the artist comes here, and he finishes the paintings and the sculptures. But if the artist does not finish the paintings or the sculptures, they go to garbage, they're not finished, they're unfinished. But he fi if he finishes them, then they become works of art and completely immortal. So for me, this void here mm -hmm. shows, is an allegory of the power of the artist, you know? This, this void is the place where the artist should stand to finish his works and to turn them into immortal works of art, which get into MoMA, for example. So this painting is important, first of all, because of the colors, but also because of the meaning. The meaning being that the artist is a hero. An arti the artist is ex has a power of being, becoming immortal through his works of art. So that's my interpretation of the, this painting. And next to that, uh, Alfred Barr is getting this piece by Van Duisburg from, from the, the Stiel group in, 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 in the Netherlands. And this is a cow which slowly becomes abstract, you see, which is wonderful. And that's also the evolution of Rothko. You know, slowly from figurative, he becomes abstract. Roscoe is also involved in group rebellions against established institutions. He doesn't like the Met, he doesn't like the Whitney, they're much too conservative for him, he doesn't fit in. And one day the people of the Met are doing a show about American art and Roscoe argues to it that it doesn't represent the most progressive dimension. Here he is in the group called the Irascible, you, know, you must know this picture. That's him, this is Barnett Newman, this is Jackson Pollock, and this is Bill de Kooning. And you notice that there's only one woman in the group, right? Hedda Hesse. Now, this is the letter that Roscoe writes on behalf of his friends, to the new, open letter to the New York Times. We draw to the attention of these gentlemen at the Met the historical fact that for roughly 100 years, only advanced art has made its contribution to civilization, sorry, uh, any consequential contribution to civilization. So this is, sorry, this is the letter to, the, the open letter to the New York Times, you see? Open letter to the director of the New York Times. So it's very pompous and very arrogant, you know? We don't want you to, we don't like your art. He does the same thing with the Whitney, but it's even more de delicate because the Whitney, the director of the Whitney the Committee of Acquisitions tells him that they want to buy a painting of his. But Roscoe doesn't like the way the Whitney, the art that the Whitney is collecting. He doesn't like regional art, you know, local regional art. He feels he's much more progressive than that. So this is what he's answering, what he's writing to the director of the museum. Since I have a deep sense of responsibility for the life my pictures will lead out in the world, I will with gratitude accept any form of the exposition in which the life and meaning can be maintained and avoid all occasions where I think this cannot be done. In my life at least, there must be some congruity between convictions and actions if I am to continue to function and to work. So thank you very much. You want to buy a painting of mine? No, I don't like your museum. So you see how he is, very opinionated, a little grumpy sometimes, but he does not fit in. The people who paved his way were this wonderful Dorothy Miller at MoMA, who did these shows called American Shows, where he was exhibited in 1952. Many women, 
Peggy Guggenheim, his first dealer, Petty Parson, his second dealer, and Sidney Janis, this marvelous man, a collector and a dealer, who turned him into a very prolific, successful, and rich artist, and stable artist. Uh, but Roscoe is not going to stay with Sidney Janis. Catherine Koo, she was uh, uh, a gallerist turned, turned curator at the Chicago Art Institute where she gave Rothko a marvelous show in 1954 and she always remained close to him. But, you know, this success, this stability, this money was not enough for Rothko and in 1959, 1960, he turns into a pioneer and he develops a la the last phase of his life exactly like Rembrandt had done. He reinvents himself at the end of his life. It happens because Philip Johnson, the architect, Mr. Dean, is, is building for, this, for the Bromfman family an enormous piece, which is the Seagram building on Park Avenue and 60th Street. And Philip, it's going to be the most, the most lavish, the most expensive, the most extraordinary building uh, in, in, on Park Avenue, the skyscraper. And this building is going to have this extraordinary, uh, I mean, ironical thing is that it's going to be not on the line of the other ones, but have a big void. And in this building will be a restaurant, the Four Seasons restaurants, for which Philip Johnson is commissioning from Mark Rothko panels. To, to decorate the inside. So it's a very great, uh, prestigious commission. Uh, Roscoe uh, gets $18,000 for that. And uh, he starts working on these uh, panels for a whole year. He changes his studio. He gets a big studio so that the, pa the, the paintings <coughs> would fit in. And he is, um, uh, once after a year of work, he's going to Europe to, with his family. He goes to, uh, to Naples to see the temples in Feistum, the Greek temples. He goes to Florence and sees the con uh, San Marco convent, uh, these uh, cells with the Frangelico on, on the, you know, on the, on the walls and he feels that it's wonderful to be surrounded by the art. So at that time, the Seagram Building Commission gives Rothko the idea that he's going to turn into site-specific art, which means art which surrounds the viewer, you know, with the notion of space. So not one painting, but a whole space. So it comes, it, it, he develops his ideas there in Florence, and then he goes to Great Britain. Here he, he's in a, an art colony called St. Ives in Cornwall, where these, the painters in Great Britain adore his work because they have been attuned to it by um, a gallerist called Brian Robertson in England. Here he's with William Scott, and Roscoe is so he feels so welcomed by those British painters that he decides on this Cornwall um, shore that he wants to buy a medieval chapel in ruin. And he feels here he is. And he says, that's where I want my panels to be. I feel they would be much better in a medieval chapel rather than with these horrible people who, sp who spend $2,000 for a meal, and I don't want those people to eat in front of my wonderful paintings. I am not going to do these paintings. I am refusing to do the panels. I call Philip Johnson, I send him back the money, I take back my panels, and that's it. I do not belong to this commercial life anymore. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of the, at the time where American art is going to take off with the, you know, the auction sales, reaching up to 80 millions for a painting now, today, at that very moment, instead of going with the grain, Mark Roscoe decides to cut himself from the commercial aspect on the art world and to go somewhere else with ethical issues. And that's where he meets. So that's where he, this is Brian Robertson, this wonderful man. 
and that's where Roscoe meets, uh, you know, Brian Robertson understands Roscoe. Roscoe is very, very, very obsessive. He is uh, a maniac. He wants to deal with every detail, every single detail in his shows. He wants to deal with the walls. They shouldn't be white, but off-white. He wants to deal with the lighting. There should be very little light. He wants to do with the hanging. The painting should not be on the, uh, you know, very low and not high. He wants to deal with, you know, with a grouping, you know, everything. And actually, and actually, um, and actually, it's because of these demands that Roscoe is pulling, putting together his final idea that art is an experience and should be exp it should be felt as an experience. You should sit in the middle of his paintings and not pass by. You should communicate with them and not look quickly. You should interact. And art should be an experience which is changing you, which is empowering you, which is transforming you. And that comes together beautifully because Dominique de Menil, this wonderful woman whom I was very privileged to meet and to like and to become friendly with because she was the most famous French person in the US when I came in 1989, Sandra, <laughs> to become cultural counselor, Dominique de Menil asked Mark Rothko, would you like to decorate a chapel in my property, the Rothko Chapel? And he said yes. And I want to tell you that Dominique de Menil was also a migrant. She was also a refugee from France, like Rothko. She came in 1941, he came in 1913. She was Protestant and Catholic, he was Jewish. She was rich, he was not rich. But they had the same relationship with American society. They were migrants. They couldn't fit with any of the established institutions, so they created a new kind of institution. Therefore, my argument that migrants are not a burden, they are a resource. They speak more than one language. They have more than one experience. They are bridgers. They cross boundaries all the time. And they can see things that people who don't travel do not see. I'm talking to you also. You know, I know that you came from Haiti when you were nine years old, right? Mm -hmm. So those people, it is only because of the coming together of those two people that the Roscoe Chapel would make possible. This is the Roscoe Chapel in front of which stands, and, and, and Dominique Dominique was wonderful because, and I, I know I'm talking to two people, prominent people from the architectural life. She said she also had Philip Johnson to build that. But she said the architect had to bow in front of the artist mm -hmm. because, she, because he had trouble with the way and so on. So it, it is extraordinary, you know. And, this is, and basically in front of the <coughs> Roscoe Chapel stands the broken obelisk by Barnett Newman, which is dedicated to Martin Luther King. And Dominique Dominil was a very radical woman, extremely radical. Once I had lunch at her table and there was a French consul there, the French consul who was a fascist. He was horrible, this man. And he said, he started to say about Nicaragua, that there was revolutionary. And she said, Mr. Consul General, I gave a mass in the Roscoe Chapel for this revolutionary from Nicaragua, and I please ask you to leave my table. It was very simple. You know? This is the way she was. You know, she was soft and up to the point. So this is the Roscoe Chapel that Dominique de Menil did uh, opened, inaugurated, a year after Rothko had committed suicide, the 25th of February 1971, day per day. And she said it's a non-denominational place. It's open to all every day for free. And here is the inside that he conceived after model, model, modeling it after the Torcello Chapel in Venice where he felt that there should be a tension be between tragedy and hope. In Torcello, there's one wall which is tragedy, one hope which is hope here. So I think that this tension between tragedy and hope is a tension that we are experiencing today, which is more, has more to do with politics, geopolitics, ethics, than with colors. <coughs> hope you agree with me. And uh, 
in this place people sit and meditate. It, for the 40 years, more than 40 years it has been built, it became the center for non-violent leaders from all over the world. Desmond Tutu, La Dalai Lama, Nelson Mandela, they all come here. Mm -hmm. So this new kind of institution invented, created by those two migrants. Um, this is the quote I like the most maybe about Roscoe's art from Brian Robertson. My strongest personal memory is of leaving the Whitechapel gallery with Rusco late one winter afternoon when the daylight had practically gone. He asked me to switch all the lights off everywhere and suddenly Rusco's color made its own light. The effect once the retina had adjusted itself was unforgettable, smoldering and blazing and glowing softly from the walls, color in darkness. We stood there a long time and I wished everyone could have seen the world Roscoe had made in those perfect conditions, radiating its own energy and uncorrupted by the artifice or the marketplace. Right now. So to, to tell you that at the end of his life, during this last period, Roscoe became very sophisticated with the ways he could create a new media to make his paintings phosphorescent, fluorescent. So he mingled, he mixed up, you know, uh, acrylic painting with egg tempera, the yolk of the egg, and many, many things to create thin layers of colors that are bringing the retina into the painting. And that is, in this way, you know, he became very sophisticated and even he became a scientist. He had to study chemistry, you know, physics, in order to understand what in a painting can force the viewer to, to, to interact, you know, to be pulled into the painting. You know, so this is the, 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 the evolution of his work. So just to finish that, I want to show you what his geographical trajectory was, and that he, he belongs to a story of displacement and migration. He was born in Dvinsk in the Russian Empire on the, on the, uh, on the north, uh, and the, the place in gray, it's called Pale of Settlement. That's where the Jews were confined in the Russian Empire. This is um, the steerage, a picture by Alfred Stiglitz, taken in 1912, which is exactly a year before Rothko came to the US, but he came in a similar ship. And I could have put many photos that you see in the newspapers these days, you know, of migrants coming over. This was exactly the feeling. And he said that he then took a boat, or he took a, 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 a train from Dvinsk to Libau, then a boat from Libau to New, New York, then went to New Haven, see these Weinstein cousins, then a train throughout the United States from New York to Portland. And he said that in, it was the most difficult time in his life, those three weeks going by train from New, New, New York to Portland, because he was a little boy dressed in black, in black, uh, like, like a Russian boy, and he, he had around his neck a, a label which says, I don't speak English. And he said, this was the worst feeling of my life. I felt like a dog, yes. you know, I don't speak English. So um, here is the trips he made back to Europe and in the United States when he was a painter just to, you know, tr always shuffling, always trying, shuttling, always trying to, to change, always trying to evolve. And this is the different places where he lived as residences and different studios in New York, always changing, you know, never in the same place because, he, you know, he was trying to. Today, this is amazing because he demanded his works be seen in a, you know, in, in a very closed place. And this is what he achieved. Roscoe's global presence in 2015 is much more meaningful than that of Jackson Pollock, that of de Kooning, that his peers, you know. And he managed, he, this is the Roscoe room in DC, which is wonderful. I don't know if you've been there. It's a must. You know, the paintings are close to the floor there's no light, there's no label, it's a very short cube, and you sit there, and when you get out of there, you are transformed. 
This is the Roscoe Room at Titmore in London. This is the Roscoe Chapel in Houston. This is the Seagram panels at the National Gallery in DC. And this is the Mark Roscoe Center in Daugavpils, the place where he was born. Now it's changed the name. These are the Roscoe murals at the Harvard Art Museums, which have been reorganized recently. And these are the, the travel trips, the, which uh, took place uh, the recent months in Poland, in The Hague, in Seoul, where I was last, um, last May. I spoke in Seoul and saw the show. And the last uh, element are the family genealogies. This is his father, Jakob Rodkovich, the pharmacist, a uh, very well-read man. This is little boy, Marcus, with his cousin, with a bow, white bow. And you can see that the cousin is a worldly man. He's, you know, he's engaging with a photographer. But little Marcus Rodkovich is not. He's a mensch. He doesn't smile. He never smiles. He never tries to comply with anybody. He is there, you know. Here we have him, you know, sitting at the feet of his mother as a little boy from the Talmud Torah, very serious. Him again. Him with his wife, Mel, that he will leave to go to live in his studio before he commits suicide. This is him and his little boy, Christopher, who has a, in a family genealogy, which is typical of the Jewish genealogy, took this manuscript, that he, the text that he found by accident in 2005. Nobody had read it. He transcribed it. He published it. And it, so it's a voice of the father who is coming to us through the work of the son. Mm -hmm. And Christopher was five when his father committed suicide. But more than that, in 2013, I was asked by Christopher and Kate, his older sister, who was 17 when the father passed away, to go to Daugavpils because they were opening a Rothko museum in, the, in Latvia, because the country now is called Latvia. So they were there. And uh, they, Latvia, I don't know if you know, is a country where the Jews have been decimated in the worst possible way. It was. Uh, a place where the Jews were very active, very prominent. And uh, in uh, 1944, uh, all the Jews were asked to walk in the cold uh, and dig their own graves. And nothing remains of Jewish culture in Latvia, nothing. So in this horrible country, uh, a few people have thought that Roscoe was born. And they decided to call the children and to build a museum. Mm -hmm. So the children decided not only to go, but to loan or to donate six paintings of their collection for this place, which is in the middle of nowhere, in homage to their father. And when they talk, when they spoke, I, I felt that their gesture w was similar to that of um, their father, who described in his book that for him, Painting was a mission, and mission I hear mitzvah, in that the work of the artist is to repair the world, and there I hear tikkun ha'olam, in the Jewish tradition. But more than that, and this gesture of you know those kids f forgiving the massacres and going and giving a present, you know, you killed my people, I give you this present, you know, was extraordinary. And it was a reparation of the world. And it was a mission. And it was their father's move. But here, this is what Kate said when she spoke. She said, when I was a little girl, she's a medical doctor, and her husband is a historian. When I was a little girl, my father would often sit next to me with a map. He would show me this territory at the crossroads of Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, and say, you cannot really see, <coughs> because now there are new borders, different from those of my time. Still, this is where I was born. So I think in this memory, the memory of Kate, and the, you know, the testimony that her father explained to her, to, to her you know, the borders were there, they're not the same. 
you know, what is a border? Who needs a border? What is a border for? Why do we build walls? Why are the Hungarian building walls? Why is Mr. Trump being, building a wall? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it for? You know, what does it mean? She described that the borders of the territory where her father was born were blurred. And I'm telling you that the borders between the colors in his paintings are blurred. And I'm going to show you what I saw when I arrived in Martha's Vineyard the other day. That was a sunset. And this is Orozco. Thank you very much. I don't want to. Now, do, do you need a microphone? She needs a microphone. Come and speak here. Did he leave a note about his suicide? Did he leave a note about his suicide? Such is a question. Did, he le did Rusko leave a note about his suicide? Okay, so the suicide is a very complex issue for me because uh, at first I, I, I refused to write about the suicide. It's something I'm in uncomfortable with and I didn't write about that. In the French edition, there's two lines. And my American publisher, Eileen Smith, told me, for the American edition, I want you to write about the suicide. So I told my husband, you know, bear with me for a week, I'll be depressed. Because you know, I had never written about it. It's, it's very hard. you know. So I worked on it. And actually, I was very grateful to my publisher. She made me work on the suicide. Because I understood a lot. The suicide starts, I mean, a suicide doesn't take place, you know, one day after, just like that. It, it's, a, it's a long process of doubt. And Roscoe starts being depressed after he gets uh, a, a heart attack. And he becomes dependent on drugs. He goes to hospital. He becomes dependent on drugs. And then he starts drinking a lot. And then uh, he decides to leave his wife who had given him stability. He goes to live in his studio. He cannot really work. He's drinking more and more. And he doesn't really produce. But he is harassed by people who want his work. So when he was very productive, he would, he would paint these, you know, these similar things. And he has 800 paintings in storages in New York. He has left his last dealer, Sidney Janis, in 1958 to go with another dealer called Marlboro, who is much more aggressive. And the Marlboro people want, don't respect Rothko and the fact that Rothko is diminished. They want more paintings and they want to sell. And he's, you know, he, he was very good at producing, but he was not very good at handling or discussing or negotiating. And uh, so he doesn't like this situation of harassment. And one day, uh, they want more and more, his dealers. And one day, they want to go to another storage that he doesn't want to show. But instead of saying no, he commits suicide. This is apparently. And then the next day, the same day, the Marlboro people go into his studio and take everything. And they buy it for a very low price. Then three months later, the wife dies. They go to the wife's place, and they take everything. The daughter is then 17. She's a student at Johns Hopkins in medical. She starts medi she ha she's a, in college, but she will start medical school. So she starts a lawsuit. And the little boy, Christopher, is six, five or six. So she starts a lawsuit, which will last 14 years, one of the worst lawsuits in art history against Marlborough, proving that Marlborough people took advantage of Rothko. And they're getting, as a settlement, as many paintings as they can, which creates the Roscoe Foundation, which is now at the National Gallery. So this is the story. And this story shows some art gallery people obsessed by money. And Roscoe decided to disentangle himself 
with the commercial aspect of art and go into another side, which is the spiritual side. So this is what, why I was grateful to be able to inquire about it, because it made me understand how significant it was, you know. Thank you for your question, a very good question. Did I answer what you... Mm -hmm. Yes? Did he always intend his work for public display in museums and galleries? I find it difficult to imagine those pictures in a home. Ah, <laughs> because you think they're too powerful? They're hostile. S hostile, you think? You think so? Think that painting is hostile? Oh, it's up to you. I don't find it so hostile. The point is, did he always intend them for public display? Yes, 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 yes. But yes. Not, not in a private home. Yes, yes. I, yes. <coughs> Sir? No. Mm, yeah. If not, is there a question? Well, will you join me in thanking and I hate to <laughs> Very fitting for him. It's sort of like a prayer, you know. Yeah, yeah.